ago, I started, um, a few weeks ago, I started this series that we talked about values over vision because it was very important to me that we didn't get so locked into vision as we come back to church that we forget about our values because good vision, good vision can be hijacked by bad values if we're not really, really careful. So I started talking to you about the importance and the depth of our values as a church, who we are, what we believe. What are the words, the things that shape the decisions that we make and the things that we do as a church? We talked about these words, love, for a couple of weeks. We talked about the word grow for a couple of weeks. Loving God, loving each other, what that looks like growing in relationship with God and growing in relationship with one another. And then I said I want to talk to you on that third value, the word help, in a little different way because of where we are in our nation's history. Because we're in a time that we're experiencing life in a hard way. Life is hard. Life is different. But it's important that we remember as a value, even when life is hard, God is still good. So I started talking to you about this message that um, a very intuitive, a very wise prophet, Isaiah, a message that he gave to the people of Israel just before the children of Israel were going to be taken into captivity. They're at a season in their nation's history where they were about to be taken captive. They were going to spend the next 400 years in captivity. And they begin to think wrong thoughts. And Isaiah, this intuitive prophet, he recognized that because their thoughts would shape their words and their words would shape their actions and their actions would become their habits and their habits would become their legacy, it was really important that he began to reshape their thoughts because they were thinking wrong thoughts. How many know in hard times it's easy to think wrong thoughts? I'm going to ask you again because that was not. How many have learned that in hard times it's easy to think wrong thoughts? That's what this prophet recognized in Israel. So he began to reshape their thinking so they would think right thoughts so they wouldn't miss out on the purposes of God for their life. And here's what Isaiah said to them in chapter 40, verse 27 first. He says, why do you complain, Jacob? Jacob is the name he used for all of Israel. Why do you complain, O Jacob? Why do you say that my ways are hidden from the Lord? Why do you say that your just claims have been passed over by God. In other words, he was saying, why do you say that God doesn't know where you are? Why do you say that God doesn't know what you're going through? Anybody ever been in a moment where you felt like even God didn't know what you were going through? He knew that that's where Israel was, and he was reshaping the way they thought so that they would behave differently. He acknowledged the fact that their problem was a significant problem. Because how many know that there are some times that we face issues in life and they're real problems. It's not complaining, it's not pouting. Sometimes life gets hard and it's very real. Isaiah, this prophet, recognizes, yeah, this isn't people pouting. This is a legitimate issue that they're concerned about. So he begins to speak to them about where they were. And I love what Isaiah said to them because it's so, it's so important. He recognized that it's real easy it's real easy sometimes to get so focused on your pain and so focused on your problem that you forget there's a promise on the other side of your problem. Too many people never get to the promise on the other side of the problem because they stop making progress through the pain because they process the pain incorrectly. And Isaiah, he recognizes that these people are beginning to process their pain in the wrong way. And he needed to reset their thinking. So he, he, he talks to them about the power of, of their, their thoughts. And, and I've, I've learned, I've told you last week, that not only is it easy sometimes to get so focused on the pain or the problem that we forget about the promise, but it's also real easy to get so focused on the promise that we forget about the reality of pain. You ever been in one of those churches and it's all about the promise, the promise, the promise, the promise, the, the promises of God. Hold on to the promises of God. The preacher preaches on the promises of God. But you know what I found in the Bible? Every time that God gives us a promise, there's also some level of pain attached to the promise. 
I mean, whenever you, you look at scriptures like Psalms 9, it says, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Here's what that means. You've got to go through some oppression before you can experience the refuge. It says he's a stronghold in time of trouble, which means you're going to have to find trouble before you can recognize and appreciate what a stronghold God really is. The Bible says in 1 Peter, we can cast, we said it this morning, cast all your anxiety upon him and he'll show how much he cares for you. Well, before you have anything to cast on him, you got to experience some anxiety in, in your life. One of, my, one of my personal favorites is, is scripture that we, we use all the time, 2 Corinthians 12, where, where the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you. How many know you won't appreciate grace until you need grace? You can't appreciate the grace of God until you find yourself in a position that you really need the grace of God. So, so Isaiah, this intuitive prophet, he's reminding Israel, yeah, listen, the pain is real, the problem is real, but you can't get so focused on your pain that you forget about your promise. You can't, you can't get to the place where you think you're going to die in your dilemma, where you put a period where God had put a comma, where, where, where you build a house where God said, no, just build a tent, where you, you, where you can't get to the place where you forget that where you're going is greater than where you are right now. Because if you get there, you'll die in your dilemma, and you will not process all the way through. You won't make progress from your pain all the way over to your promise. So Isaiah is teaching with balance. He's balancing out the reality of the world that we live in. That, yeah, there's going to be, there's a lot of promises. But there's also some pain that's going to be, Jesus said, in this world, you'll have what? Trouble. And Isaiah is helping them to realize the pain, but also how to progress all the way to the other side to where the promise is. And here's what he says to them in verse 28 in Isaiah 40. This is great. He says, have you not known? Listen, he says, now why do you say God doesn't care? Why do you say God doesn't know? Then he, his next sentence says, have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the creator to the ends of the earth, he never faints, he doesn't get weary, his understanding is unsearchable, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases their strength, even the youth shall faint, they're going to get weary, but young men, they'll utterly fail, but those who wait on the Lord... He's going to renew their strength. They're going to mount up on wings like eagles. They're going to run and they won't be weary. He says they're going to walk, but they, they will not faint. Powerful, powerful picture because here's, here's what he's saying. Waiting on the Lord isn't lazy. Waiting on the Lord doesn't look like standing still. Waiting on God to move. Waiting, he says, waiting in the word of God is mounting up on wings of eagles. It's, it's running. It's, 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 it's walking if you can't run anymore. Remember the Bible says faith without works is what? Faith without works is what? Come on, y'all can talk back to me. It's all right. The, the more you talk, the shorter I preach. Faith without works is? He says, he says, to them, listen, you can't just wait on the Lord. You got to stay busy. You got to stay active. You've got to remember the best way for you to get past your pain and past your headache is to serve something that's bigger than you are. You want to change your perspective on pain? You want to change your perspective on trouble? You want to change your perspective on hard times? Find something bigger than yourself and start serving it. He says, he says it, it produces something very new in our life. He says, haven't you heard, have you, haven't you remembered that when you get weak, God gets strong? The creator of everything, he never gets weary, he never faints, he never fails. Yeah, young men, even young men will get weary. Even young, strong men will lose their strength. Those that wait upon the Lord, wait appropriately. Waiting in Scripture doesn't mean being lazy. Waiting in Scripture means mounting up. Waiting in Scripture means running. Mounting in Scripture means walking. Waiting in Scripture isn't standing still doing nothing Why God does everything. He says those that wait upon the Lord, he says they are going to renew their strength. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago something that I've realized in my life that's really, really powerful, and that is this, that, that God's, God's strength is only made perfect in our weakness, which means until 
I acknowledge my weakness, I'll never appreciate God's strength. See, here's what I've learned. God, God will never give you a life. He'll never give you a life that makes him unnecessary. If, if you're living at a season in your life right now and you feel like God's un- unnecessary, here's what I can tell you about your season of life. That's not the life God intended for you. Because God will never give a person a life that makes God unnecessary. His strength is only made perfect in my weakness. I can only appreciate his strength when I acknowledge where I'm weak. A couple of weeks ago, I told you a couple of stories about how that's played out in in my life. But the one point that I left you with two weeks ago was the purpose of pain. So often, you know, we, we just want pain to go away. We don't look for the purpose that pain's intended to serve in our life. Pain always has a purpose. God never wastes a crisis. Pain pain always has a purpose. And I told you a couple of weeks ago that one of the great purposes of pain is it produces partnership. Pain, Pain produces partnership because pain in my hands will blind me, it'll confine me, it'll bind me. But pain's in the hands of partners, pain's in the hands of of, of other people. Will give me strength. We, 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 We often think, especially us men, we think, well, I can handle my pain. I mean, I can deal with this. I'm a man, I'm strong, and... We, we put these trophies on the shelf of how we handle our own stuff. And we don't even recognize it all the while. While we're hanging that trophy up on the shelf, we're playing right into the devil's hands. Because God didn't make you. God didn't make me to carry my own burdens and to carry my own problems. In fact, God made Adam. And the first thing God said wasn't good was that Adam was alone. And it wasn't that God needed help procreating the earth. God can do that all by himself. He did it once. How many know he can do it all over again? God God created a helpmate because God recognized that his creation wasn't good all by himself. And the first thing that pain does is it pushes in its proper proper place is it pushes us to partnership with other people. When I'm in pain, I need somebody who can say to me, hey, Scott, listen, listen. I don't, don't, listen, don't get so focused on your pain that you start cursing the thing that's pushing you to the feet of Jesus. Don't ever curse a pain that pushes you closer to God. And sometimes partnership is the only thing that can remind us of that. But pain, in its proper place, it pushes us. It pushes us into to partnership. But the other thing that partnership does is it pushes us to the promises of God. Pain will push us to partnership with the Holy Spirit. It'll push us to partnership with one another. That's why we have groups. That's why groups are so important because you need somebody to push you to the promises of God when you don't have any push left in you. When I don't have anything left in me, I need somebody. I need a friend that loves me enough when I'm complaining about the pain in my life who will say, Scott, listen, stop complaining about something that's pushing you to the feet of Jesus. I need somebody who will say, he'll say, Scott, listen, in the midst of your pain, I want to push you. I want to push you to the promises of God. Because it's so easy in the middle of our pain to miss the promise. It's so easy in the middle of our pain to get so focused on the problem that we lose focus of the promise. And a promise is a powerful thing in our life. I'm going to tell you about a a promise in 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 a few minutes. Because a promise produces that thing in our life that all of us need. Whenever hard times come, whenever trouble comes, whenever difficulty comes. Because it's so easy to lose perspective in the middle of pain. We get so focused on what's in front of us that we forget about the promise that's way ahead of us. But here's what I know. Here's what I can can promise you is, is this. When you allow your pain to push you to partnership with the Holy Spirit, to push you to partnership with, with, other, with other people, you can know this, you're going to get through your problem. You can know you're going to get through your pain. 
You're going to get through your, your hard times because you're going to have somebody there who will pray for you, who will help reposition you, who will help do for you what Isaiah did for Israel, and that is reset your thinking. It's the reason every year we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's the reason we do 21 days of prayer because every once in a while we need a reset. We need to reset our minds. We need to reset our thinking. We need to remind ourselves that no matter where we are, we are intended by God to allow whatever problem problem we're going through to push us to a deeper level of partnership with him and partnership with other people but here's what you've got to do you want partnership with God you want God to help you with your problem you want God to help us with the pain this world we want God to help us through a pandemic we want God to help us through racial tensions here's the first thing we've got to do listen you've got to invite God into the situation well, if God loves me, I mean, he knows what I'm going through. Surely he'd show up for me if he really loved me. No, that's not the way God works. Listen, tell you one thing about God. He is not a bully. He will not go where he's not invited. We have to invite God into our situation if we want God to intervene in our situation. And that's what Isaiah is telling Telling the people of Israel, he's trying to help them to, to see what, what's what he says next in verse 29. He said, those who have no might, he increases their strength. You know what that means? That means that there's going to be seasons of our life that, that you can't do it on your own. And when you can't do it on your own, this is a reminder that God is always there with you. And God is always there for you. In Acts chapter 4, there's a powerful story about Peter and John. I don't know if you remember Peter and John, but they were two of the disciples of Jesus. And in this particular passage, right after the day of Pentecost, they had gone out and they were just performing amazing miracles. And people were blown away at their courage and blown away at the work and the ministry that they were, they were performing. And the Bible says this about them. It says the people, they saw the courage of Peter and of John and they recognized, watch this, they recognized that they were unschooled and that they were ordinary men. The, the King James Version says they recognized that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they were astonished. And the people around them took note, watch this. The people, they saw, now, now you, I want you to see what's happening the world is looking on at Peter and John. They know that Peter and John, they don't have an education. They don't come from wealthy families. They don't come from well-known families. They come from, uh, they come from places that they didn't expect anything to come out of these guys. And yet now they're doing things that nobody ever expected them to do. And the Bible says they were astonished. And they took note that they had been with God. Their pain... Push them to partnership with God. And something so transformative happened in them that everyone who looked at them took note that they had been with God. You ever, you ever known somebody that you knew they had gone through some problems, they had gone through some trouble, they had gone through some hard times, maybe difficult season of, of, of their life, you know, and you didn't expect... You know, you didn't expect them to be full of joy. You didn't expect them to be full of life. It's like, man, if anybody has a reason to be a little bit down right now, it's them. But when you get to them, they're full of life and they're exuberant and they're, they're full of peace. Not happiness, but peace and full of joy. And you're like, man, where did all that come from? You took note that surely they've been with God. You ever met somebody and they were just unassuming, like you met some, maybe you played sports and you met an athlete and, and they didn't look like an athlete, but then you got them on the field and they were fast and they were coordinated and they were just good and you're like, man, I never saw that coming. Or maybe you, maybe you, you know, you do business with someone or you see someone and you judge the book by its cover and they begin to speak and you're like, whoa, I never expected that to come out of that. You ever seen people like, you know what I'm talking about? That's what was happening in this moment with Peter and John. They didn't, the people around them, they didn't expect anything. But all of a sudden, they're seeing everything. And they knew it was because they had been with God. People were like, how do you have so much power? How do you have so much courage? How do you have so much joy? We know who you are. We know what you've been through. We know where you came from. We had this ex expectation, but man, how are you producing this? Here's the, here's, the, here's the reason. Here's how.
It was the power of inviting God into their situation. It was the power of prayer. They just invited God. If you want God to help in your pain or help in your problem, you have to invite God in. But I can promise you this. They, they, looked, at, they looked at Peter and, and, and they looked at John and they said, we don't even know how you're doing the things that you're doing. But they took note that Peter and John had been with Jesus. And here's what I can promise you about, about your life. You partner with Jesus. Listen, you partner with Jesus in, in your, prob- your problems. And I can promise you there is a promise on the other side of that partnership with Jesus. See, here, here's what I know about your life and, and, and about my life. And that, that is this. You can hold on to that promise no matter what. No matter what's going on in your marriage right now, you can hold on to that partnership. No matter what's going on in your finances right now, you can hold on to that promise. No matter what's going on in your job right now, no matter what's going on in your health right now, you can hold on to that promise that if you will connect, if you will invite God into your circumstance, God will empower you in your circumstance and the world will take note that you have been with God. Because I can promise you this, on the other side of your loneliness, there's a promise. On the other side of your pain, there's a promise. On the other side of your marriage difficulty, there's a promise. On the other side of your health difficulties, there is a promise. On the other side of loneliness, there is a promise. On the other side of whatever pain you're going through, there is a promise. If you and I can just make sure, like Isaiah was telling Israel, we don't get so busy looking at the problem that we miss out on the promise. If we don't get so busy focused on the pain that we miss out on the promise that's on the other side. You serve a God who wants to be invited in to your pain. He wants to be invited into the problem. He wants to be invited in to the circumstance. And when he is, he'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above everything you ever ask. I remember, I remember several years ago, my son, he was, um, he was in, I think, the sixth grade, and he had a science project, and and um, he asked me to help him with it. I had just gotten back from a mission trip. He had to do this project on third world countries and how they got light and electricity and how they, uh, how they operated without electricity and how they got light. And how it, it, was, it was a crazy project. They had to do this little shoebox. And he asked me, he said, Dad, would you help me with the project? And I was so, you know, I was just excited. My son asked me to help him with the, the project. Usually mom gets asked to help with all the homework assignments, and now he's asking me. So you know what we did? We went out, we built this big, we got, not a shoebox. I said, shoebox? Who needs a shoebox, man? We're going to build a house. So we built this house, and, and we spent a bunch of money. We put a tin roof on the house. We, put a, we, we cut a hole in the top, and we put a bottle in to show how they produce light inside the house. In third world countries, we painted it black and red and put a big Georgia Bulldog emblem on the front of it, put it on a big platform. That's it right there. That's the that's our project. That was it. And when my son, when he, he was so proud that we did that together, number one. But then I remember taking him to school, uh, opened the back of my truck, and, and he got and put, put, took that thing out. He's walking it in. The, every, all these other kids are walking in with little shoe boxes. He's walking in with a big old house. I could tell he was so proud of that thing. And then all the other kids, they're looking, man, that's cool. That's awesome. Leaving theirs on the other side of the room. He's looking, they're all looking at his. And Harrison told me that night, he said, Dad, thank you so much. Mine was the best project in in the whole school. And you know what? He never asked me to make it the best. He never asked me to spend a bunch of money. He never asked me to go over and above. He never asked me to do anything special. He just simply said, Daddy, will you help me? And when he did, I wanted to do exceedingly, abundantly, above everything he had ever asked or he had imagined. You know why? Because he was my son. And the Bible, the Bible is so clear. The Bible says, man, if you, if I, being men, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to his children? And God just wants to be invited into your circumstance. He just wants to he just wants you to ask him just just please God please come in here's what else I learned pain in its proper proper place will push you to partnership partnership with each other partnership with the Holy Spirit that partnership 
will push you to the promises that are in God's word. Third and last point, the promises of God's word will push you to power. There's power in knowing you have a promise. You know why a lot of people quit before they get to the promise? Because they lose focus of the promise and they just focus on the problem. And a problem never produces power, but a promise always will. When you and I allow our pain to push us to partnership with the right people, My, main, my, my brain's just spinning right now. I want to preach about partnership with the wrong people. But I've got eight minutes left, so I don't have time for that sermon. When you allow your pain to push you to partnership with the Holy Spirit and partnership with the right people, that partnership will push you to the promises. And they'll help paint, point you from your problem to your promise. And that promise, listen, that promise will begin to produce power for you to live in. Let me show you a little bit of what that looks like to the best of my ability. How many of you, how many have, have heard of a lever? You know what a lever is? This is the oldest, one of the oldest, one of the oldest tools known to man. It's a lever. This is a lever, it's got three parts, it's got, it's got the load in, the heavy load, and then it's got, it's got the arm, and then a lever always has a fulcrum. And I want to I show you how this fulcrum relates to God in your life and my life. Because so many times, you, you know, your life is like, a, is like this arm, you've got... You've got the leverage in, you've got the pressure in, and you've got the, you've got the load. Sometimes you're just carrying a load. You're carrying problems. You're carrying burdens. You're, you're carrying things around. And you, you don't really know what to, what to do with, with all of, all of those, those things. I, I, I thought about this, this burden that I'm carrying, this, this problem big suitcase that's loaded down with metal stuff that these guys put in it. It's a heavy burden. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's weighing down my arm. It's weighing down my life. It's, it's a load on my life. And, and I'm pushing and, and, and pressing and I'm, I'm working, trying to, trying to move it, but I, I, can't, I can't get my weight behind it. I, can't, I don't have enough strength. I can't, I can't move it. The biggest reason why is because God, I've, I've positioned God too far away from my problem. And so many times, well, I mean, I've got this problem, but I'm a man, and I mean, I like to deal with my own stuff, and God, you know I've got this problem, and I'd, I'd like for you to help me. Thank you, God. But then I leave, and I go over here, and I start working on my own problem. I mean, I gave it to God once. If he cares, he'll come. And I keep working on my problem. And, and, and what God's saying is, Scott, would you please let me in on your problem? Would you please let me help you with your problem? Would you please let me get close to your problem? Bring me in on the problem. I want to help you with your problem, but you've got to bring me in on your problem. I want you to help me get close to your problem. And I look at, Look at this situation, and I'm thinking, man, I'm working on my problem. I mean, I'm working. I got, I've got this. I, I, I know I've already given I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on somebody, one of my friends, somebody I've partnered with. They, they remind me of this promise. They say, hey, listen, listen, you know, you send enough email to God, but God doesn't operate off email. God operates off an email. My partner says, why don't you just invite God closer to the problem? And what happens? I begin to move God closer and closer and closer. 
And my carpet's moving. And closer. And my carpet's still moving. Now I've got a double problem. And I bring God closer and closer to my problem. And I say, God, I'm moving you in on my problem. I brought you from the outskirts of my pain, and the outskirts of my problem, and I've invited you in to the core of my problem. I've invited you in to where my problem exists, to where my pain is so real. All of a sudden, I've got to keep i got to keep working. I mean, it's not that I don't have to do anything because waiting is lazy. Those that wait upon the Lord are going to mount up. He's going to renew their strength, and I'm going to run and not be weary, and faith without works is dead. So what am I going to do? I'm going to keep pushing, right? I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to pray until what? Something happens. When I was a youth pastor, I used to preach every year a series, pray until something happens. Push. you got to keep pushing. Don't pray and give up. Don't pray and walk away. Don't pray and throw in the towel. Pray. you got to push until something happens. Keep inviting God in. And as God gets closer and closer, and I keep pushing and pushing, before I know it, all of a sudden, I've thrown off my problem because I brought God in on my problem. And I... God has leveraged me with power of the promise that when I invite him in to where I am, he'll begin to move on my behalf. It's my prayer for you. My prayer for you and for me and for us is that we would recognize that it matters. The closer you get God to your situation, the closer you get God to that marriage problem, the closer you get God to that work problem, the closer you get God to that, that financial problem, that physical problem, that emotional problem, the closer you get God, the more power and authority you walk in because now you've not just leveraged your strength and your knowledge, but you have leveraged the very power of God to help you overcome the problem that you're facing in the world. I, I don't have time to tell you the whole, the whole story. Now, I've told, some of you have heard this before, but all of you haven't. I, Every time, I, my dad is such a great mentor and role model to me, especially in, in, in times like these, because my dad is one that understood pain. He, he understood what it was like to be abused as a child. He understood those things. I don't have time to walk you through the whole story, but part of that story is, is my dad had the courage to take his pain to take his problem, the abuse that he was going through, and take his problem close to God. Get God close to his problem and invite God to help him with his problem. And Dad, I think about all the time the days that you couldn't get a ride to church and your car was taken away if you were going to church. And God always sent somebody to pick you up. Never had to walk. Because when you bring God to your problem, God always brings you a solution. I think about... Those people... Those people who would stop and pick you up and didn't even know who you are. I think about your, your problem, your pain, push you to partnership with people you didn't even know. They didn't even know you. They never stood behind a pulpit and preached. They never led a small group. They never, never, may have never led a Sunday school class. But they did, what they, did, they did what they could with what they had. And a car is what they had. And I don't even know if they knew what they were doing, but they were push, positioning you to a place that was so close to God that when you invited God into where your pain was, God can help you leverage his power to overcome your pain. And there's no way that my dad could have known at 17 years old that him leveraging God in his life to help him push over that pain and push toward and progress toward the, pro the promise that he would have his own marriage after a, a, a Years of divorce after divorce after divorce and abuse after abuse after abuse. But 
My dad bringing God close to that pain would enable my dad to not only break that generational curse, but to preach the gospel for over 50 years and have a marriage that lasted over 50 years and produce sons and grandchildren that are in ministry today and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have been impacted for the gospel of Jesus Christ because a 17-year-old boy decided to invite God into where his pain was. What might God do in your life if you would just invite him in to the pain? What might God do but you got to invite him in. Because he's not a bully. He's not going to push his way into a place that he's not been invited. But my prayer for you is that you would forever remember that you have a God in heaven who never sleeps and he never slumbers and he never gets weak and he never grows weary. And his power and his strength is unsearchable. And he gives grace and he gives strength and he gives power to the weak. And the closer you get him to your problem, the more leverage he gives you to overcome your problem. The closer you get him to the pain, the more leverage he gives you to overcome your pain. And my prayer for you is that you would have the courage to invite God in. To whatever it is you're facing whatever it is you're going through whatever you're going to go through you'll never forget that God is like your fulcrum and when you keep your fulcrum far, far away from your pain from your problem for that burden from that load you limit his strength and you realize how limited your strength is when you maximize God as your fulcrum and you pull him closer and closer and closer to your pain and to your problem, you not only leverage his strength, but he maximizes your strength. And then you in power can overcome your pain and your problem. And I hope today that some of you will make a decision to invite God into your pain. I know as a nation, as a nation, we need to leverage God in our country. We need to leverage his power. We need to leverage his strength. We need to leverage his wisdom. And I hope that you'll continue to pray for that. But today, today, I've got two things I want to ask you. Number one, number one, if you're here, and you would say, Scott, there's some pain in my life that I need to invite God into. I need to reset the fulcrum and bring God closer to my pain so I can leverage his power and mine. Pray for me. Pray for me, Scott, as I move. As I move the fulcrum to maximize his power, pray for me. Because I need God's power. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. You know who you are. And he says, if you'll acknowledge him, he'll acknowledge you. So if, you if you'd say, Scott, pray for me. Pray for me. I need that partnership. I need to reset my mind on the promises. And I need those promises to produce power as I invite God into my circumstances. If that's you, you'd say, Scott, pray for me today. I need that. Just raise your hand. Anyone in the room, just raise your hand and hold them up high. I want to pray for you. Hold them up real high all over, all over. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every hand that's raised. You know every need that's represented by those raised hands. And Lord, I'm asking you, I'm asking you now in the strong, strong name of Jesus to see every heart, to recognize every need, and to move on behalf of every circumstance. God, they're raising their hands today because they need your power. They need your strength where their strength has grown weak. 
And Lord, in your strong, strong, strong name right now, I ask you, I ask you to move for them. Let them even now begin to take power from the promise that reminds them that you're for them and not against them, that you're with them and not far from them, that you're as close as a prayer, you're as close as a child's call, you're as close as their invitation. And Lord, I pray over every circumstance. You know it. You know what it's represented in their life. You know the pain and the problems that it's caused. And I'm asking you now to move on their behalf. God, even now, even now, let them feel your presence. In the strong name of Jesus. The strong, strong name of Jesus. Everybody who believes it says together, amen, amen, and amen. Now, now here's what I want you to do. There's some of you that may be in the room right now, and maybe you've, you've limited God's work in your life because you've limited your relationship with God. Maybe you've never given God all of your heart, all of your life, or maybe you have never fully surrendered to God. And today you want to do that. Maybe you have lived for God or invited God into your heart at one season of your life, but for whatever reason you've, you've drifted away from that relationship and you just need, you need to come back. You need, to, you need to pray that gospel prayer. The gospel simply says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and death separates us from God. But the gospel is that God sent his son to die on a cross and raised him from the dead and he said if anybody if anybody calls upon the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Maybe you're here today and you're not fully, fully confident that your relationship is right with God. And you want to commit yourself to him. I want to pray with you. Nothing, nothing would be a greater honor than to pray with you. So if that's you, don't worry about this audience. That's the only audience that matters. Not because you're afraid you're going to die today or tomorrow, but because you know you've got to live tomorrow. And living with Jesus is a lot better than living without Jesus. If you say, Scott, that's me. I need, I need to give my, my heart to Jesus. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I want to see you. I want to acknowledge it. Anybody in the room? God bless you. I see you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. I see you. Anybody else? I need to give my, God bless you. I see you. Anybody else? to give my heart to Jesus. Those of you who raised your hands, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your heart. The rest of us in the room, every voice in the room is going to pray this prayer with you. And at the end of this prayer, we're going to celebrate because the Bible says that when one person gives their heart to Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. All the angels in heaven right now are already throwing a party. And as soon as we say amen, I want you to put your hands together. I want you to raise your voices. I want you to celebrate because somebody, somebody, somebody got their heart right with Jesus today. Amen. So come on, let's pray with those who raise their hands, everybody. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you are always more than enough. Today, I acknowledge. Come on, everybody, pray it. Pray it like it's your son. Pray it like it's your daughter. I acknowledge today that I am in need of a savior i invite you lord jesus to come into my heart to forgive me of all of my sins to give me a brand new beginning to acknowledge me in heaven as i'm acknowledging you on earth empower me by the holy spirit and fill my life with your love and with your purpose and it's in the strong name of jesus Come on, everybody pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, now make some noise. Make some noise. Celebrate for those who just prayed that prayer. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yes. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. I love you. Those of you watching online, we love you. Can't wait to see you in church real, real soon. Tell somebody what God's doing around this church and around this town and in your life this week and invite them to come to one of our three services next Sunday morning. I love you. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome.